Okay, I hope you didn't have too much to eat for lunch, <laughs> so you won't be sleeping now. And um, so the next lecture is by Marcus Heil on introduction to dynamical quantum phase transitions. How many lectures do you have? Uh, I have four hours in total. Four, you have four, four, hours. four hours. Very good. So this is two hours? Yes. Okay, yes. very good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to have this extended time here uh, to tell you something about um, this concept of dynamical quantum phase transitions, which is an attempt to extend the notion of uh, phase transitions to the dynamical non-equilibrium regime. Um, so compared to the um, previous lecture, we will now uh, enter the quantum world a bit and in particular study the non-equilibrium real-time dynamics of quantum anybody systems. Um, if you're interested in uh, knowing more or beyond those things I will tell you in this, in this lecture, you can always have a look at this rather recent review summarizing the recent developments in this context. And let me also quickly emphasize that uh, many of the things I will tell you would not have been possible with uh, the help of many others that you can see listed over here. Okay, so now, of course, we are all familiar with uh, phase transitions in our everyday life. Uh, one of the uh, examples which are best known to all of us is probably boiling water. So take your liquid water and upon heating it up, we see that uh, we can transform, uh, obviously, liquid water into gas upon increasing, increasing temperature, an experiment every one of us has been doing at some point. Uh, if you look at this process from a thermodynamic point of view, for example, by studying the entropy of our system, we would observe that upon increasing the temperature, that because this is a first order phase transition, the entropy will uh, exhibit some kind of jump at the boiling temperature, so increasing suddenly and drastically uh, at the boiling temperature. And this is already one incarnation. Here you can see already one incarnation of a phase transition, which is that um, thermodynamic uh, quantities become non-analytic uh, as you tune uh, the control parameter of your transition, which is temperature here in this context. But now let's take a different point of view and um, do the experiment actually in real time. So what will happen now? So again, we will start with a liquid initially uh, at a temperature below the boiling temperature. And now uh, we start to heat it up. Um, but uh, monitor now the properties of the system, not as a function of the control parameter, but really as a function of time as we see our water starting boiling. For example, here let's measure, for example, the temperature of our, uh, of our uh, system as a function of time as we heat it up. Now the situation is a bit different than before. Uh, initially, we will see, of course, that um, the temperature of the liquid water will uh, rise up. Um, but then, as, as soon as it hits now the boiling temperature, uh, the temperature will actually not increase anymore. It will stay constant over some time. Um, and then eventually it will start to rise again. First of all, uh, and that is most important for what I will discuss in the following, if you study this experiment or your phase transition as a function of real time, actually, and the properties you study are actually smooth, not non-analytic, as we have seen before when you study your phase transition as a function of a control parameter. So the temperature very smoothly um, reaching the boiling temperature here and then rising again. The reason why we have this intermediate plateau for this first order kind of phase transition is just that we have a latent heat here. Um, we have to provide the latent heat, and since we only can provide a finite power with our heating machine, this takes some while, some time until we have provided the latent heat to uh, 
and bring water in, uh, into its gas state. So everything is now smooth as monitored as a fun uh, when monitored as a function of real time. And the main point now of the lecture that I would like to show you in the following is that when you go to quantum systems, things can be actually different. What you see here, and I will discuss this in more detail later, later on, you see here some quantity, which is called lambda, I will define it later, as a function of time. And as you can see, uh, this function can become non-analytic, and not as a function of a control parameter, but as a function of time, as you let your system evolve. And this is now what uh, has been termed uh, a dynamical quantum phase transition, and I will discuss it now in quite some length in the following. And let me emphasize that this here is actually uh, not theory data, that's an experiment. And there are many more experiments that have been appeared uh, rather recently, which all show uh, signatures of this non-analytic real-time behavior. So it's not only a theor theoretical uh, concept, but also uh, has been subject to experimental verification in quite many cases. OK. and. Um, with that, let me give, uh, tell you a bit about the outline of, of this lecture. Uh, initially, since this is the first lecture on quantum systems and non-equilibrium real-time dynamics, I will actually would have to put actually a point zero initially. I will uh, try to motivate uh, initially quite, uh, quite in some detail why we are interested in studying systems like this. And then I will give you a rather extended introduction into the basics of this, these dynamically quantum phase transitions. And in the remaining parts of the lecture, I will try to address some uh, um, more specific properties that these dynamical transitions can have, like, and which are also important when you want to connect to uh, the concept of equilibrium phase transitions, which is about scaling and universality then essentially about uh, one of, in more detail, about one of these uh, experiments that I've been showing you before, which is uh, about dynamic tra transitions in systems with symmetry breaking in equilibrium. And in the last two parts, uh, let's see whether I make it, whether I make it there, <coughs> about uh, uh, dynamic transitions in systems with topological properties, and finally, um, how you could use this concept to dynamically characterize quantum walks. So, um, before um, uh, going on, um, let me also emphasize that I would be ha uh, happy if you interrupt me at any point if there's something unclear or when you want to know more. Okay. So now let me start with a rather um, general introduction into uh, non-equilibrium dynamics of quantum many-body systems. And um, in particular, what I will f uh, consider in the following is the purely unitary dynamics, uh, unitary real-time evolution of closed quantum many-body systems. So of a quantum systems, of a quantum system which is decoupled from uh, any environment such that its uh, evolution is governed only by a Schrodinger equation, um, which you all well know. <coughs> um, yeah, let me say that in the following, I will always use units where we set h bar equal to 1. If we have a time-independent Hamiltonian, that's the case I will consider mostly in the following, we can solve formally this equation rather easily uh, in the following form. So, uh, in general, um, the, um, one can uh, imagine a, a, a vari variety of different aspects uh, that would, one could study in the context of such non-equilibrium systems, so we always have initially our system prepared in some well-defined initial states, some, initial, some well-defined initial state, uh, 
Here some particles localized on a lattice. Then we act on our system with some external force, uh, which uh, induces some real-time dynamics on intermediate time scales. Here, particles starting start uh, to hop around the lattice. And finally, if we wait long enough, if we, we let our system evolve, we will see some relaxation to some uh, a long time state, which here is depicted as these particles maybe delocalized over the full lattice. Um, about these long time steady states, there are many important and fundamental questions associated to it. Uh, I will not discuss them uh, in very much detail. Uh, you will see some of them probably in uh, later lectures. So there are important questions of thermalization about uh, the foundations of statistical mechanics or um, uh, I, about some metastable precursors of thermalization called pre-thermalization or about some uh, robust absence of thermalization in uh, systems with strong disorder which goes under the name of many-body localization. What I will talk about is not associated to this long-time dynamics, um, but rather something which, um, is, uh, con which concerns uh, the dynamics on short-time or intermediate time scales, um, these uh, dynamically quantum phase transitions uh, are a phenomenon which uh, uh, deal with these intermediate stages of time evolution. So why should we currently care actually about such a, a scenario? Why should we care about such non-equilibrium uh, quantum real-time dynamics? And the reason is uh, that these kind of scenarios can nowadays be realized experimentally studied and probed experimentally um, in various kinds of systems which go under the name of quantum simulators. Here you can see a, non, uh, a list which is not fully complete, uh, like systems uh, made up of ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices or trapped ions, Rydberg systems, superconducting qubits, but also, but also more. So all of them have the special property that um, they are well isolated from the environment, so they, are, they represent to a very high degree of accuracy closed quantum systems um, for which you can induce some non-equilibrium real-time dynamics. And in the following, I would like to slightly to flash a few, um, few um, um, phenomena that uh, dynam purely dynamical phenomena that in the meantime have been already observed experimentally and which should, uh, are supposed to highlight why that this is not <coughs> a field which is at its infancy but rather has managed to study rather intricate quantum anybody problems. So on the one hand, uh, I mentioned already this phenomenon of many body localization which is some non-ergodic phase of interacting uh, quantum matter uh, in the presence of uh, strong disorder. And for example, here you can see two uh, experiments, one done in ultra-cold atoms and another one done in uh, trapped ions, which managed to observe this phenomenon. Um, another, uh, maybe even more prominent one, which has attracted a lot, a lot of uh, attention recently is that of uh, time crystals, which even made it to Star Trek, someone told me, um, which in the um, experiments that have been performed is something like a period doubling in a phenomenon in periodically driven quantum systems, um, which uh, realize um, some time translational symmetry breaking, and there are uh, mostly the two pioneering, I would like to mention the two pioneering experiments. One uh, <coughs> realized in a system of nitrogen vacancy centers and, an and another one realized in, in, uh, in trapped ions. And what you see there is some kind of a signal at 
half the driving frequency here and here, which um, corresponds precisely to this uh, period doubling phenomenon or frequency halving phenomenon that realizes time translation symmetry breaking. But there are also like two others that I would like to mention. The other one is like uh, is pre, uh, so called pre thermalization, which is a long lived meta stable state and weakly interacting system systems or uh, another generic uh, in, or like inherent dynamical uh, phenomenon of particle antiparticle production in gauge theories which has been realized in trapped ion systems. So all of these examples are supposed to show you that um, um, from the experimental side there is uh, a lot of things that you can nowadays do and which motivate for us to uh, study uh, non-equilibrium quantum real-time dynamics. Okay, but now what is, what is now the main, the main challenge in studying theoretically such kind of systems? And that's somehow almost the definition, the states that are generated by, um, this, by this closed non-equilibrium dynamics are quantum states for which you cannot write down a free energy. There's no description in terms of a free energy that you could use to describe these states. In other words, there's no thermodynamic description. So we cannot use the tools of thermodynamics to understand principles of, of quantum real-time dynamics. But maybe that's not only bad. One can also take it, uh, look at it from a different point of view. It also means that um, we are not subject to some equilibrium, we are not subject to some equilibrium constraints, such as the principle of equal a priori probability that all states at a given energy have to be equally populated. Uh, in equilibrium, you always have that, but for these quantum states, you principally have a way to generate uh, states that do not have to satisfy those, uh, those rules. Uh, which uh, gives you the possibility to generate new quantum states which are hopefully interesting. Examples of that you have seen on previous slides, like um, this many-body localized phase, phase or discrete time crystals. They necessarily require precisely to break uh, these equilibrium constraints. These are phases of matter that you can only generate when you don't have a description in terms of a thermodynamic uh, ensemble. <coughs> so now have, like, um, not having a free energy, um, however, immediately uh, leads to some major questions, and that is, since we cannot use a thermodynamic description, um, how can we then describe such non-equilibrium states in some, at least partially unified manner, or in different terms, can we identify some general principles in unitary dynamics which don't require thermodynamic description? And these are now questions I would like not to uh, address in full glory, but um, parts of it at least. Okay. Now I would like um, to discuss the definition of this uh, dynamical quantum phase transitions and to discuss some um, basic uh, principles. Okay, so for the following, I will use a very sp uh, specific non-equilibrium uh, scenario um, to illustrate everything. However, let me also emphasize that what I will uh, tell you in the following does not rely on this particular uh, non-equilibrium scenario of uh, a quantum quench. And a quantum quench is, like, uh, is conceptually very simple. Um, what we do is we prepare uh, initially our system described by some quantum Hamiltonian in the ground state of some what we call initial Hamiltonian H0, and this ground state we denote, I will denote in the following uh, as psi naught. And then at time t equal to zero, 
we suddenly switch a parameter in our Hamiltonian such that uh, when we have switched the parameter, the, uh, our system is then described by a new Hamiltonian H. And because of that, when we solve Schrodinger's equation, the time evolution of our state will now be of the, or the time evolved state at some time t will then be of this form. Okay, so now um, having that, um, let me introduce now the central object that will appear uh, throughout this lecture many times, and I will call it in the following a uh, Loschmidt amplitude. And that is nothing than the, uh, I will, which is denoted by this uh, curly G here. It's nothing but the overlap of the time evolved state with the initial state itself. And for uh, this quantum quench protocol I, will, I was uh, showing you on the previous slide, we can write this, of course, in the following form. Uh, this object, depending on the context you are, uh, like or this, this quantity appears in various contexts, and depending on the context, it also has different names. It also goes under the name of return amplitude or vacuum persistence amplitude, fidelity. You can choose the name you wish. Uh, in the following, I will uh, use the notion of a Loschmidt amplitude. And um, from time to time, it will also be useful to study the corresponding probability. I will call Loschmidt eco, which is nothing but the <coughs> modulus squared of uh, this amplitude. So why is this uh, quantity now interesting? Ah, now let me say one thing, one uh, thing before. So they, this quantity has some uh, very important property that will appear in many places in the following, in that um, it will have a particular dependence on the number of degrees of freedom, and you will see later on why it will have, why it has to have that. Um, it has to, this Loschmidt amplitude exhibits large deviation scaling, meaning that uh, it depends exponentially on system size or number of uh, spins, in general the number of degrees of freedom you have in your system, that I will denote by n. Um, and uh, the small function g, I will de uh, denote and will call in the following a, a rate function. In other words, this quantity curly g does not have a well-defined limit, a thermodynamic limit. It's only the log of this uh, curly g, uh, essentially the small g, which has a well-defined thermodynamic <laughs> limit. That's why we, we will study this one in the following. On, in two, three slides, you will, you will uh, also see why this is the case. And uh, the same thing also uh, is true, of course, then for the uh, corresponding probability, this uh, curly L of T. It also has this large deviation scaling, which allows us to introduce this rate function lambda. And because this is the uh, modulus square of uh, the curly G, we have that this lambda is nothing but two times the real part of this other rate function, small g of t. Okay, now, um, what is now a dynamical quantum phase transition? You have seen it already on one of the previous slides. Uh, it's a phase transition which is uh, not happening as a function of some external control parameter, so some parameter that you can control from the exterior, like a temperature, pressure, or magnetic field. It's uh, a phase transition which occurs as a function of time, so occurring only due to internal changes that occur in your system, not imposed by the outside, but only occurring due to internal changes. And um, more concretely defined as a non-analytic behavior in such a rate function, like the small g or small lambda, as a function of time. As you have seen, 
in one of the uh, previous plots. So here you see a measurement of this uh, small lambda of t, which is uh, minus, one, uh, minus 1 over n, n number of degrees of freedom, log of the uh, Lo Schmidt eco here. And as a, uh, as a function of some dimensionless we scale time, you see that there are kinks appearing. And those points where these non analyticities appear, uh, I will call dynamical phase transitions in the following. Yeah, please. Um, no, not really. Um, let me, uh, on, I think on the next, or um, in two slides, you will see maybe a, a, some way of how, how you might think about it. Okay? It's not a simple, I would not consider it a simple correlation function. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, I will actually discuss this particular case in quite some detail later on. Um, for that particular uh, experiment, or that particular experiment, I was realizing um, some kind of long-range transfer speed icing model. But you will see later on the details about this experiment. Yes? Uh, yes, um, not thermodynamic limit, which... Uh, You, you will see later on that the thermodynamic limit is essential and why uh, n, uh, like a system of 10 spins is sufficient here to say, make statements about phase transitions, you will also see later on. Okay? Yes? Um, no, this transition does not have to, has to do anything in principle with uh, a transition of this form. Um, there are diff let, let, me, uh, let me take the chance here maybe to um, make the following statements that there are various other notions of dynamical transitions uh, in the literature. For example, uh, for, the, for other genuine non-equilibrium transitions like the many-body localization uh, transition, um, but these are transitions of different kind than those that I will discuss here in the following because those are transitions which occur at f some finite time. The other ones are typically associated with some long time limit. Although some of these other dynamical trans transitions connect also to those ones, but that is uh, not a general statement that I can make. Okay, so now, that's the definition, this non-analytic behavior in this rate function. And the remaining part, or the main, uh, remaining time of the, uh, the lecture, <coughs> I want mainly to address two different questions here. And the one, first one is, uh, why can this be? Why can this function be non-analytic as a function of time? How is this uh, at all possible? And the second one, uh, which is the more non-trivial one is what does it mean to have a non-analytic behavior in this quantity as a function of time. So let me first, uh, this will now require a few, few slides. Um, let, me, let me first try to um, argue that why this quantity can become non-analytic and that in particular, that this is nothing accidental, but something which is um, um, as generic as, or like that these dynamical transi transitions can happen as generic as there are also equilibrium phase transitions. And the main observation here like that lead to this conclusion is that these uh, amplitudes or uh, that I was introducing before actually formally resemble quite a lot equilibrium phase transitions. Uh, up here you see um, the canonical partition function of a system described by a Hamiltonian at some inverse temperature beta. Already here you might recognize some 
similarity to this low Schmidt amplitude in that it is a, some kind of an average of an evolution operator. Um, but there's an even more, like formally, uh, even more closer uh, connection to a, a certain class of partition functions, and these are called boundary partition functions. You can see them uh, written down here, which uh, appear when you have systems subject to boundary conditions. Consider, for example, a Casimir effect, uh, where you have two metal plates in between uh, some uh, enclosing some medium. And when you want to describe the equilibrium physics of such a system, then um, you can show that you can write down uh, or can describe the properties in terms of such boundary partition functions where these two so-called boundary states encode somehow the boundary condition. R denotes the distance of these two boundaries and H is the Hamiltonian of the bulk in between. Um, now, Having such a boundary partition function, this is almost the same, is exactly the same structure than for this uh, low Schmidt amplitude I was showing you before, except that uh, we would replace this R by some IT, by a complex number. So you can think of this low Schmidt amplitude as a partition function, um, but a partition function at complex parameters. Um, or in a different way, you can think of this low Schmidt amplitude as a boundary partition function where uh, the boundary, partition, boundary conditions are not imposed in real space but in real time. So it's your initial condition, your time evolve, your initial, uh, your initial state, and you project at some point uh, t later in time back on your initial condition, which realizes some, uh, the two boundary conditions in time. So from this analogy, formal, formal analogy, we uh, see that these low Schmidt amplitudes are uh, partition functions at complex parameters. Already from there you might uh, believe me that uh, this quantity can become non-analytic, um, but uh, I would uh, actually in the following few slides would like to show you that um, one can make this uh, much more rigorous, and in particular to connect uh, to other equilibrium principles here. Yeah, please. Um, R is the distance of, between the two boundaries, the spatial distance. Yes. Of course, we are here in this not notation, I'm using certain units for, uh, for space here. Yeah, yeah please. Yes. Please. Yes, you can define for generic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's. Yeah, if you, for example, if you would like to, to describe the Casimi effect, you could. Uh, uh, you could do it by uh, solving uh, this quantity. But here I will only use it um, to draw some formal analogies. So I don't want, it, it's important that uh, also to emphasize, although there is this formal similarity, there are also differences that I would like, that I will point out at various, uh, at various points later on. That there is a formal equivalence um, but there are also differences on the physics point, on the physics side. So now, uh, um, it's actually an interesting uh, point that uh, already in, this, in the sixties, people started to realize that it's on a form level, it's useful to study partition functions in complex parameter planes. At that point, it was more like it was a purely um, uh, formal mathematical way of uh, studying phase transitions, as I will show you in the following. So completely abstract concept. Here it becomes uh, physically relevant. 
And what has been done um, in this context in st for uh, studying complex partition functions is that you take some parameter here like inverse temperature, but you could also take a magnetic field or a coupling and extend it to the complex plane artificially. So give it a complex number, replace it by a complex number Z, say. Um, when you do that, so why, why should you do that? Um, you do that because um, um, you can then say two things. The first one um, is the following. Um, like when you do it for inverse temperature, when you replace inverse temperature by some complex number z and study its partition function, uh, written down here, um, the partition function is only a sum of exponential functions, which means it's an, anal it's an analytic function as long as your Hilbert space is finite. So when you consider, for example, a system of fermions, Hardcore bosons, or spins on a finite lattice, when your Hilbert space is finite, then your partition function is an analytic function. And these analytic, the proper, like this analytic property you can then uh, use um, to, uh, um, understand the structure of partition functions in a bit more detail. And in particular, due to the following um, rather mathematical theorem, but which will turn out to be rather important. So if you have an analytic function in the complex plane, uh, then there is the Weierstrass factorization theorem, which tells you that those analytic functions actually behave almost like, like a polynomial, in that you can write this function in terms of a smooth part, a part which always remains smooth, this mu of z, and <coughs> um, as some kind of polynomial uh, which includes all the zeros of, of this function. Okay? So like, like you would do for a polynomial. For a polynomial, you would not have this uh, smooth prefactor, only this uh, product of of, of zero, um, um, uh, this factorized product involving the zeros on the right hand side. Which means, in the end, that um, if you are interested in some non analytic structures of your partition function, or later on, because we now know that partition functions are formally Lo Schmidt amplitudes. If you're interested in the non-analytic properties of that, uh, of that quantities, this information is only contained in those zeros, of, okay? Because this function mu of z is by definition always a smooth function. It, uh, it, has, it will never um, lead to some non-analytic behavior. So now that we know that we can uh, write partition functions in this form, we can also um, write down this Lo Schmidt amplitude in this form involving only the, uh, the zeros and some smooth part which we will not care so much about because we are interested in non-analytic behavior. So um, that's fine. Um, we, know, know, we now know that the non-analytic part, non part is contained in the zeros. What can we... Uh, how can we use this now in the following? Is yeah, please. This statement obvious? The statement is only because this mu of z is always a smooth function. So, okay, so, that's not so, if, so if there's something non-analytic in, in this function z, since it cannot come from this part, it can only come from this zeros, zeros part. Yes, you will see. Yes, yes, yes. I'm a bit sloppy here, but you will see precisely this point of taking the free energy will be in the end be non-analytic, not Z itself. And that's what I will discuss on the next uh, two, three slides. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, so first of all, it has to be analytic. Uh, in the whole complex plane. Um, if it is that, then I think that's already sufficient. 
from a, a practical point of view, I would say all um, partition functions in the complex plane which are uh, described somehow realistic systems uh, will, do, will do that. Yeah, please. Sorry? Yes, so the number of zeros increases uh, as you increase the number of degrees of freedom. So there is a connection, but um, uh, I would not be able to tell you, uh, tell you more details, of, can, can be more concrete, but it increases when you increase the number of degrees of freedom. Yes. Okay. So, in order to understand what now these, uh, what these zeros mean and how they can lead to non-analytic behavior, um, um, it's actually, it would, it turns out to be useful to study not the amplitude, but rather the, um, this low schmidt equal the associated probability. Uh, if you have non-analytic behavior in one uh, or the other quantity, uh, or like, it doesn't matter. If you have non-analytic in this L of Z, you will have it in G and vice versa. So, but it will be in terms of, a, a, you will see on a, a, to get some physical intuition, it will be more useful to study this L of Z. So it's the absolute square of, of this amplitude. So you will have, uh, there's actually a two missing here. You would take two times the real part of the smooth function and the absolute square of all these uh, expressions involving factors involving the zeros. <coughs> but um, as you all know, um, actually um, the uh, uh, relevant quantities to, to study in the thermodynamic limit, also in terms of thermodynamics, you don't study partition functions, but you study, study free energies, um, which means taking the logarithm of of the partition function, and um, um, here, and studying the um, the intensive contribution, like the corresponding density, meaning that you divide by the number of degrees of freedom. So concretely, uh, what I previously called the rate function lambda, one might, due to the uh, connection to partition functions, also think about a dynamical analog of a free energy density. Again, this is a formal identification. There are many, this is not a thermodynamic property. So defined as like uh, the logarithm of this uh, L of Z and then dividing by the number of degrees of freedom. Now we will uh, ignore completely the smooth part here because we are only, only interested in non-analytic contributions. So we only uh, consider uh, the product involving the zeros so taking the log of a product, we can uh, rewrite this as a sum of logs here. I think, I hope this is somewhat uh, obvious. When we are interested in the singular part here. Yes? You will see, you will see. Yeah? Uh, can you say it again? So these zeros uh, depend <clears throat> not only on your final Hamiltonian, which is doing the dynamics. It only depends on your initial condition, which is the boundary condition. So depend, they will change. So like the precise location of your zeros will change both upon changing your initial condition and upon changing your Hamiltonian. Uh, however, um, this does not mean that like, uh, they change in an arbitrary way. Uh, they change in a certain way that you can still get some meaningful information out of these, studying the zeros for a concrete problem. So now let me... In so why I'm, I'm doing that? Because uh, I would like to get some physical intuition about, uh, give you some in physical intuition about these zeros. Let me define uh, a density of zeros, rho of z down here. Um, 
which is minus 2 over n, sum over n delta function of the uh, delta z, um, zn minus z. If I'm doing this, I can rewrite the singular part of my uh, free energy now in terms of an integral involving this row of z, uh, namely in the following form, that the singular part of, of the uh, dynamical analog of the free energy is like uh, integral over the complex plane over this density of uh, uh, complex partition function zeros and then this log, which we had from, from before. And now this quantity that you see here has a very nice analogy to some problem you already know from electrodynamics uh, lectures. Namely, you can think of this, uh, this lambda s as an electric field generated, an electric field in two dimensions generated by some charge distribution rho of z. And why? Because uh, this log of z bar minus z is nothing but the Green's function uh, in two dimensions. So, uh, using this analogy, you can immediately uh, uh, see when this, when this lambda, your electric field, uh, can become non-analytic. If your charge distribution is analytic, your electric field is also analytic, is also a smooth function. The only possibility to get... Ah, please? Ah, please? Can you speak a bit louder? Sorry. Uh, ah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so what kind of charge distributions can you have? So you can, uh, you can have either point charges, you can have that your uh, charges uh, form lines, or you can have that these charges form areas in the complex plane. Here, the complex plane is made up of some real time, one axis, imaginary time, the other axis. So now whenever, as I said, whenever your charge distribution is smooth, also your lambda will be smooth. So meaning in those regions where there are no charge distributions, where there's no charge, uh, of course the charge distribution is smooth and therefore also your uh, potential lambda has to be smooth. However, for example, you know that uh, at surfaces of charge distribution, uh, surfaces, uh, char charge distributions necessarily have to be non-smooth in order to like vanish completely. This can only happen in some non-analytic manner. So you know that at those uh, surfaces or uh, lines where some area of charge distribution becomes zero, you have to have a zero, like you have to have a non-analytic behavior of this lambda. <coughs> In this way, you can see how uh, the, the zeros completely determine whether your dynamical free energy can become, uh, is uh, uh, an analytic or non-analytic function at a particular point. Okay? And also, you see that uh, it can happen. So there's nothing accidental in all that I showed. I only sh what I was using is that the formal analogy to a partition function, and then using this general uh, uh, analysis of complex partition functions to show you that at uh, uh, um, that the zeros of the partition function or the corresponding uh, distribution of zeros determines um, where you will find non-analytic behavior and where not. So, ah, this I already told you, so like it can only be non-analytic at a point charge upon crossing such a line or on the surface of an area. So that these are the points where your lambda can be non-analytic. Okay, so now uh, uh, a quick wrap up. So we have, I already said that essentially, so we have seen that these 
uh, amplitude has this formal structure of a partition function, however, at complex parameters. The singular contribution to the, this dynamical free energy, uh, you can think of an electrostatic problem, and from that electrostatic problem, you can understand where you can get non-analyticities and where you cannot. And therefore, it tells us that uh, these functions can become non-analytic. There's, not, uh, there's nothing mysterious to that. And the non-analytic structure is only given by this distribution of the zeros. Okay? Yes? Um, of course, like what you have, what you have to have is that. So let let me go maybe back to the definition of this density of zeros. So that's the definition. Um, of course, what uh, you uh, what I've assumed somehow in the following that this function has a well-defined thermodynamic limit. Um, <coughs> but I can assure you. Uh, in the generic case, it will have that. So you need this one over n suppression in front of here to get a well-defined limit for that quantity. So like yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, it turns out actually that uh, the typical scenario is that somewhere in the complex plane that you will find, so in one dimension you typically find lines, in two dimensions and higher you generically find areas. Um, that's the generic behavior from examples I know both from equilibrium and now this uh, non-equilibrium context. So uh, somehow these zeros have the tendency to tendency to form structures. So they're not randomly uh, uh, placed somewhere in the complex plane, but somehow they tend to form structures, like lines or areas. Why this is the case, I don't know, honestly. But from all the examples I know, this is typically what happens. OK. OK. Now, yes, I was here. OK, so now I've. This was more like a formal part to show that these things are, can be non-analytic, so why uh, these dynamical transitions can appear. Um, but now the, uh, comes the more important part, and that is, of course, equilibrium phase transitions are much more than uh, just non-analytic behavior of, the, of a free energy. Um, for example, there are the powerful concepts of scaling and universality. There's the notion of an order parameter. We know how to macroscopically describe phase transitions in terms of Landau or more generally uh, field theories. There's a certain kind of robustness of, um, <coughs> of uh, phase transitions to perturbations and many more. One could list more, uh, much more of these points. Uh, and what I will tell you uh, is not that um, uh, we already have a full understanding uh, how to or how or to which extent all of these uh, important aspects apply also to these dynamical transitions. Um, but you can see already here on the right hand side some references where uh, all of these points have been addressed for a particular uh, for particular models and particular problems. We don't have a full understanding yet, but uh, uh, at least already at this point, I would like to point out that uh, many of these uh, important properties of equilibrium phase transitions also take over. And mainly I would like to discuss this in the following, but also let me uh, emphasize that there are many similarities, but there are also differences. So it's not like just replacing temperature by time, and uh, then you get uh, all the same um, physics again. There are differences, but also many things which are uh, behaving the same way. And 
With this, actually, I'm uh, very happy right now. So I would suggest now maybe to take a 10 minutes uh, break before we continue with the second part of this first lecture. Thank you. <laughs>